newlyweds, I was a new wife, I was a new mom, I was a new soldier. And I felt that I had to be as good as I could be to get into heaven. I grew up on a farm in Ohio, and I was going to church with my parents. But I trusted God, and that's the important thing. You have to trust God. Until a very young age, I lost my parents. That's when I was crying along the road in uh, Nigeria where I was born, and God met me there, right there. And my father saw that I was bored and leaned over and he says, you know, if you listen, you won't be so bored. So I listened. I drove by here on East Randolph Road and I saw the sign for Forsy. I said, you know what, I'm going there. And I was like, this is a place where we can embrace a family. Today, I just want to run up here right away and uh, get started. I think singing that song, I ran out of that grave. Maybe you want to even more so run up and just share some of what God's been putting on our hearts as, as a church. And we've had to wait a whole extra week to be together for this. So we really are better together. I love the technology that enabled us to experience a little bit of each other last week. We were able to tune in to some of that. But this is where church is at. You know, it's people together. said, you know, I just, everyone I've met from Forsy seems just very mature spiritually and, and strong, you know, in the Lord, and, and, uh, and that was, you know, neat to hear, and I couldn't take any credit, I said, I, like, I can't take any credit for that, because I've only been here for a few months, but that's the Lord at work, right, that's the Lord at work, Pastor Matt down at the well in Silver Spring said, man, I just hear about your diversity, and, you know, we have some culture diversity, but I wish we had more more uh, age diversity, you know, we need some more older people, you know, in our congregation, and, and he just values what we have in terms of our diversity here, and we were talking about that, uh, Pastor Brian from a church down in D.C., and, and Pastor Randy from Columbia Presbyterian were talking about just, you know, I think they'd heard of our school and some of our camp ministry, and we're just amazed at how many people are coming in and out of the building every day, things that we kind of take for granted, but can we give God thanks that he's doing this? And my heart kind of leaning into this year just became, how can we be faithful with all that God has given? You know, what would it look like to be faithful with all God has given? I mean, people have ideas and visions of all kinds of things that could happen in and through us, but I just see so much all that God has already given. And I know God says if we're faithful with what he's been given us, with a little, he will give us more. I already believe he's given us a lot. But even more, as we're faithful of what he's given, whether that's stories to tell. You know, people get baptized next week to tell their faith stories. God's given them a story to tell, so they're going to be faithful to tell it. Whether it's ministries to build up. We want to, you know, invest in our ministries and leaders to invest in and empower. God's given us leaders. We want to empower. God's given us ministries. We want to build and, and grow them. We're talking about a ministry fair toward the end of March that we'll be talking with our leaders about to try to build their ministries. But part of it is this whole emphasis that we've had in this series of Ephesians called This Is Us. It's that God's given us a diverse body, and how can we be faithful to build unity among the diversity God's given us? Not just unity in the sense of an absence of conflict, because it's not like there's all kinds of of conflict around, but unity in the sense where we're pursuing meaningful relationships with each other. 
And when I say meaningful relationships, I, I mean the kind of relationship that hurts you when it's not going well. That's how you know it means something to you. You know you've got something special if you're hurt when it's not going well. And those are the kinds of relationship God longs for us to build because he longs for us to grow through that to become more like him as we persevere in that. And so, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but today I want to camp out a little bit longer in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. We had a wonderful speaker two weeks ago, uh, Stephen, one of our global partners. He's serving in Southeast Asia, and he walked us through because his, his ministry is just a perfect illustration of what this looks like. But I just want to dig a little deeper into the context. So we've done this a few other times, but today's going to be a day when we're going to kind of try to be better doers of what we've already heard. Because okay? we've heard this again and again. Now think about it. John chapter 17. Let's read this together. We read this a couple months ago. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, so that may be be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me. And then as we've been in the book of Ephesians, let's read this in chapter 1. He made known to us the mystery of his will, which he purposed in Christ, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And then he says in chapter 2, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And then we saw in chapter 3, The mystery is that through the gospel... The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And then two weeks ago in chapter 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Whew! That's a lot to think about. I mean, he's just been hitting us again and again and again with this, with this theme. Now, we're going we're gonna to move on. We're going to... The coming weeks look at spiritual giftedness and ministry and Christian living and marriage and family and parenting and spiritual warfare. But first, I think it's appropriate just to stop and reflect on what we've been hearing week after week. To consider, Lord, what would it look like to be, as Martin Luther King Jr. called, not just professors of something, not just professing something, but practicing it. To bridge that gulf between profession and practice. You know, what would it look like for us to be doers of this word that we've been hearing? Let me pray because we're going to need God's help to do that this morning. Lord, we've heard you so clearly. And I pray today your spirit would enable us, would inspire us to begin to envision more what it could look like if we practice what we've heard. As your word describes, if we would be doers, not just hearers. Lord, speak to our hearts today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 4, verse 1. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I just want to highlight the context here. As Paul says, he's finished his first three chapters of Ephesians. Much of that was themed in Christian unity. It says, as a prisoner of the Lord, remember back in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, chapter 3, 13, don't be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Very much the reason Paul's a prisoner is because he believes in the Christian unity that can come through the gospel, because he's preaching to the Gentiles and trying to bring all people together as one body. When he says he's a prisoner, they remember, oh yeah, he's in prison because of this because of us, because of church, because of the one body that he's to believe God has made us to be. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. I want to suggest to you that in context, this is not an individual calling, although there's all kinds of ways in the, in the book of Ephesians that God will invite us to apply things personally to our individual lives, that this is a corporate calling because he's talked about how we are called to be heirs together, shares together, members together. He's laid out, he's revealed the mystery of the church, the one body of Christian unity of all people through Christ. That that's the calling he's given us. That's the calling we've received. 
He's made it so. Now we have to walk worthy of the church, of the one body, of the unity that he's made us, that he's made us to be. We've talked how this is not just, you know, traffic church. You see a very familiar picture there of traffic, right? We've talked about how traffic is we're all in our own lane and we're all staring straight ahead and the only time we notice the people around us is if we're mad at them about something. That's traffic. And if we're not careful, that can become church. Especially because, look at us, we're all just, you know, in our lane. So we got to not be deceived by this, okay? Because church is meant to be more like a, a train journey where we're all on one track in one car going the same direction. But look at how this meal car of the passenger train is set up, right? It's set up to invite relationship and conversation and fellowship. And that's more what church ought to feel like what we see in that picture, but that is not easy. And that's why he says in verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now you could say, come on, really? Do we, do we really need to be told that? We Christians that know Jesus? Do, I mean, isn't that just part of what we naturally do already? No. No. <laughs> But we get surprised sometimes when we're in a church and it's like, oh, I just saw some conflict or I'm at conference with someone. Oh, no, that must not be good. That must not be right. I got to get out of here. But what marks God's people has never been less conflict. It's always been greater commitment to relationships. If anything, because we're so passionate about our mission, there's potential for more conflict. But we persevere because we're committed to each other, which means there's forgiveness and reconciliation and grace and a pursuit of love and understanding. See, God knows that we're going to need to hear this, and so 59 times in the New Testament, he uses the phrase one another. I printed the 59 times on the back of your bulletin. Love one another, accept one another, greet one another, serve one another, carry each other's burdens. You won't see that kind of language in other religious texts. I was thinking about this. Some of today's message is just going to be things God's kind of impressed on my heart and mind through his word and experiences in the last couple of months. And one thing is this. I'm pretty sure that we're the only world religion that needs relationships to do what God's called us to do. Think about it. It's essential to to who we are, to love the Lord and to love our neighbor as ourself. In the, in the five pillars of Islam, you know, there's fasting, there's, there's prayer, there's pilgrimage. I mean, some of that stuff you do together, but not with this kind of emphasis. With an eightfold path, there's you know, having a right view and a right conduct and a right all this, this, and this, but most of that I look at, I can do that on my own. Secular humanism, our philosophies today, you know, they, they celebrate diversity and, and, and we need to accept one another. But that doesn't mean we have to get involved in each other's lives at all. It just means don't you mess up my life. As long as you don't mess up my life, then I'm okay with you. Right? That's not Christianity. We're called to pursue meaningful relationship with one another. And it gets messy, especially because we're also one of the only world faiths well, religions, I, I know we're, I don't even think of us as a religion. I think of us as a relationship because it's core to who we are. But in that sense, we're the only one that is not tied directly to another culture, right? Our speaker talked about this two weeks ago, you know. To be Muslim is, you know, to embrace certain aspects of the Arab culture, Jewish, the same. You know, most other philosophies are tied to specific cultures. Our culture is Jesus, right? Our culture is kingdom. And so that gets hard because that means there's going to be all different people coming together and it's going to be messy. And so that's why there's books out there like this written, Relationships, A Mess Worth Making. That's the title of this book. I love some of the, the quotes in here. The Bible assumes that relationships on this side of eternity will be messy and require a lot of work. Here's another one. Only when human beings live in community do we fully reflect the likeness of God? Why? Because God is community. God is trinity. God is three in one. So when we live in relationship, when we live in community, 
we reflect his likeness. And so your first point is simply this. Don't settle for less than the glorious mess of the one another kind of relationships that God has called us to. Oh, it's messy, but it's glorious. And it's good for us. And it's essential to our mission and our purpose as a church. And the second one point right along with it, the effort that he calls us to make in relationships is worthwhile. It's worth it. Don't believe the lie that it's not. Look at verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You know, I love again that it presumes that there already is a unity. God's given us a unity. The question is, will we walk in it? Will we keep it? Will we maintain it through this bond of peace? It's like Martin Luther King Jr. would, would talk about how we all came from different ships, but now we're all in the same boat. Right? In church, we're from all different places and backgrounds, but we are all in the same boat. The boat is the body of Christ, and we're on mission together. And, and the relationships and the one another's are essential, are absolutely essential to that mission. Now, I just want to share with you for the remainder of our time some reasons God's put on my heart of why it is worth it to make every effort. Why we have to get serious about this and endure it. And the first one is this, because Jesus calls us to it. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The second, love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. In John 13, he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So now he's saying, that's, that's bigger than the golden rule, do unto others as you've done to you. His, his rule is, do to others what I have done to you. And it, what he did was set aside glory, put on flesh, came into our space, incarnation, to relate with us, to reveal himself. Now, it's, there was such a picture of that incarnation reality a couple weeks ago at the, at the funeral, at the homecoming service of Lorna Wilkins, who's a dear woman who served in our four-year-old classroom for 40 or 50 years. And Peggy Trout, who served with her, got up and she stood right here and she said, I'll never forget the day when Lorna told me, because they were working together in that classroom, that she said, Peggy, you've got to change your clothes and wear something more comfortable because you've got to get on the floor with these kids and you've got to relate with them. And I thought, my goodness, what a challenge. What am, what am I willing to change in order to relate with people? That, that's the question. What needs to change in order for me to better relate with people in order ultimately to better obey Jesus who's called me to relationships? Maybe it's, maybe it's not my clothes. Maybe it's my schedule. Maybe it's my attitude. Maybe there's some things I need to repent of that allow me to do what God's called me to do. Because we're not just to tolerate each other and, get, and, and stay out of each other's way. We're to be meaningfully engaged with one another's lives. What needs to change? I have to ask myself that question. What needs to change? Here's a second reason why it's worth it. Because Jesus models it. Think about it. He engages with people. We take it for granted. He didn't have to do it that way. He could have just shown up, stood on a mountain, and said, hey, everybody watch. I'm going to make some new animals that have never been made before. I'm going to heal some people. I'm going to make them sick first, and then I'm going to heal them just to show off what I can do, and everyone's going to follow me. I mean, he, he could have done it in any kind of impersonal way that he wanted to do. What did he do? He hung out, for the most part, with 12 guys and a number of ladies and other followers as well. And on the third day of his ministry, when he knows he's got three years to get this done so that 2,000 years later, we would still be talking about it on the other side of the planet. And on the third day of his ministry, he doesn't break out the whiteboard and unveil the strategic plan and say, you guys got to go do this, 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 this. I've got it all worked out. He goes to a wedding and hangs out with some people. And weddings then were a week long. It's people. He models how to have meaningful relationships. I was telling our elders, and they all do this in different ways, but I was just telling them how I was blessed by Bob Wiltrout, who 
has long been part of our elder board and was our head elder when I got here. When he would come in to meet with me uh, early on, I would think, oh boy, I wonder what's on Bob's mind today. I wonder what issues, you know, he's going to want to bring up. I wonder if I'm ready to think about all that. You know what he talked about every time? People. Hey, you got to meet this person. Hey, I want to introduce you to this person. Hey, we got to pray for this person. Hey, we... it was an agenda full of people. I have to learn from that. That speaks to my heart. You know what else Jesus modeled for us? He models knowing each other's names. I'm, I'm kind of known for this in some ways by some that feel like I, I do this well and I do work at it. Okay? But I know there's others of you that I know that have been like, oh, what's your name again for the sixth time? Forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at this. And I'm constantly saying I'm not very good at this, even though some you know, would think that someone like me is. But I do work at it. You know, after I meet people, as I'm visiting around, I'm, i, I got to confess, I'm writing your name down. I'm typing it into my phone. And then that night I'm praying for you. And then usually Tuesday or Wednesday that week, I'm praying for you. And then Sunday morning, the last thing I do before I walk in here in my office at about 8.30 is look back through names of people that I've met in the previous weeks and pray again. But it's not because I'm good with names. You know why I do it? Let me tell you why I do it. gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. My shepherd knows my name. A good shepherd those names. If we are going to become like Jesus, then we are going to need to know some names. We're not good at it. It's awkward. It's, it's downright embarrassing sometimes. Can we just agree to give each other grace and get to work on this? This is what we had to do with Fen. We brought her home from China two years ago. All she's ever heard her whole life for 11 years was Chinese names. It took her two solid months to learn the names of her five siblings. And she still struggles to say at least one of them. But you know what? She did it. You know why? They're family. It's, it's hard. We, you know... We've got some different names <laughs> represented here. Not just that your name is different to me, but my name is different to some of you. Right? Should that stop us? Can we, can we take the time and just say, excuse me, well, I just want to spell that out. I did that with Heirut this morning. It's over here somewhere. I, said, I think I got it. H-E-I-R-U-T, right? Heirut? Why? because my shepherd knows my name. Paul, Paul knew some weird names. <laughs> Romans chapter 16, he lists, he names 37 people by name. Andronicus, Ampliatus, Urbanus, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Persis, Asyncritus, Phlegion, all those names we stumble over, he knew them all. Because his shepherd knew his name and because he was a good shepherd. And, and I just think we need to give each other permission if we're serious about this. I just wonder what it would look like if we all did this and learned one new name every month. By this day next year, there'd be 6,000 relationships that much more meaningful in this church. I did the math. One a month per person. Just turn the person next to you, 
hey, be here for worship next Sunday because I, I want it to be easy. I want to... I need you to stand right here. I'm going to review my notes on my way in. And I'm going to get this down. Like, and it's grace, right? Like, we, we're not good at it. And it's okay. But can we also be okay to try? I think, I think we can. Look, we're never going to be a church in, with our size. That We'll never be a church where everyone knows your name. But we can be a church where enough people. We can be a church where enough people do. Here's another reason we got to make every effort. How can we get serious about learning each other's names? That's the question. How can we get serious about learning each other's names? Next, next one. Because we long for it. We long for these relationships. Here's a passage on my heart from this past month, from Luke chapter 12. Something Jesus says, I, I think it relates to this. Jesus says in Luke 12, do you think I've come to bring peace on earth? No. I come to bring a sword, to bring division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. That doesn't sound like the prince of peace, does it? What's he talking about? He, he is a prince of peace. He longs to bring unity to everyone, but he's dealing with the reality that when some people take a step toward Jesus, they are simultaneously stepping away from their family. And when they trust in Jesus Christ, they are simultaneously forsaking their family. And that's real in our world, but it's real in our region. And here's what I think, and I just, I've been thinking about this. Like, if we are going to be a church that's going to invite Muslim people to follow Jesus and people from strong world religious backgrounds, Ethiopian Orthodox backgrounds, you know, name it. We better be a strong enough family to be their only family when we invite them here. Because we might just be their only family. And some of you have told me that your Forsy family is your real and only family already. And it's time to get serious. And the question is, am I, am I, I have to ask myself, am I helping to make this church a strong enough family to be someone's only family? Am I doing my part? I'm so blessed by Justin. Justin's done his part, at least in this way. He's going to come and share how the Lord enabled him to be intentional to help this family be that strong of a family. My name is Justin Taylor. Uh, I've been coming to 4C or associated with 4C in some way for about eight years or so. Uh, and through Crossroads, I actually met Crossroads group outside the church. And So I've been coming here to Forsey for four years. Um, and I first thing you probably need to know about me is that I am a pretty strong introvert. Um, it takes a lot for me to get out and know people, uh, meet new people. Um, and so when I started coming, um, I had friends already at the church. And uh, when I would come, I would go sit toward the back with them, and I'd hang out with them a lot, um, and I, for the most part, I was kind of content with that, being an introvert, uh, but then one day, I was just sitting back there, and it, God kind of opened my eyes and said, you know, you're content with these friends that you have here, but this is your church, and I looked out from the back, and I could see all the backs of the heads, like, these are a lot of people I don't know. Um, and I thought I should probably change that, which was scary for me. Um, but so I, I started thinking, how can I change that? But I also started thinking, um, what does the church have 
to encourage me or anyone else to change that and reach out and get to know the other people that you don't normally hang out with. Um, so I started thinking about that and it occurred to me that uh, a good solution to this could possibly be actually one of my passion and hobbies, which is board gaming. Uh, and so uh, I stepped out and I, the fact that I stepped out as the introvert that I am, uh, to me really shows that this was God's will. Uh, he was the one doing it. Uh, but no, I, I stepped out and I talked to a few friends of mine and together uh, we came to the church and said, what if we did a game night? And we went through the whole process, went through interviews with Pastor Ron and worked all the logistics, and scheduling a room and getting all that done. And so now for the past year and a half or so, we've been running this game night on uh, it's, uh, two Fridays out of every month. Uh, and we just invite anybody who wants to come and hang out, play some board games, get to know some new people. Uh, and uh, over that year and a half, I can say I have definitely made some new friends, some very good friends, uh, that I had uh, been going to church with them for a few years already and had never even met them up to that point. Uh, I've met people from outside the church. We've had people come in and, and join our group, uh, and we've gotten to know them as well. And so uh, God has definitely been working through that, and I've been very happy to have uh, been a part of setting that up. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Is, isn't that exactly what we're talking about? You know what I love in, in that story is the, the moment when he looked around and instead of feeling like, man, I feel like no one knows me here. Maybe I don't belong here. Because I know Satan was telling him that lie. But God gave him courage to, to believe the truth that he did and that he could do something about it. How can I change this? How can I make this family a strong enough family to be someone's own family? And it's happening twice a month, every, every Friday night. Join them. Join them for a board game. Where have we heard this before? God uses board games to bring people together. Does that sound familiar? That was two weeks ago from our global partner in Southeast Asia. Same story. God's at work through building Christian unity. And your last reason why this is worth the effort is just because the world needs Jesus. And that's what we're seeing in, in Southeast Asia, for example. And, and here's your point. The clearer, or sorry, the closer that we are to each other, the clearer God is to the world. That's why they're using unity almost as an evangelistic strategy over there because like the closer people are to each other, the greater opportunity there is for the gospel to transfer through relationships and the clearer that God will be to the world. That's why Jesus said in John 17, if you, know, you love each other in this way and become one in this way, then the world will know that I sent you, that I, the God of community, the God of Trinity, that you are mine. That's what's at stake. And, and who better to do this than our Forsy family? To paint a picture for the world of clear God and his heart for the world. So what, so what does this mean? So what does this look like for us? So that's what we've just been asking, you know, as leaders. And we've decided, you know, we did a 40-day season of prayer back in the fall, not because, you know, it had never been done before or would continue at that you know, level of focus forever, but because we wanted to grow some momentum in prayer and, and take a season and just focus our hearts that way and see what God would do. And so we're envisioning a 50-day season of fellowship, uh, 50 days of friendship, we're calling it. And actually, this is day eight, congratulations, because it was supposed to start last Sunday. <laughs> So we're already behind on this church. We've got, to, we've got to get going on this. But we're just asking the question, what if we gave a little extra energy in the next two months or so to prioritize fellowship, to, to build friendship? What could that look like? And we suggested a, a strategy uh, there, number one, of having some friendship meals. Psalm 133 we've looked at. It talks, celebrates how, how precious it is when God's people live together in unity. And... I've kind of taken that as a, as a challenge 
what would it look like for us to have 133 of these meals? No, not all together like this. But what if in and among and through us, 133 times in the next 50 days, people invited someone over that they don't already know really well or even went out together or just, you know, there's no perfect way or right way to do this. But the idea is the principle, get with someone you don't know great and try to get to know them. That that, that, that we are saying is kingdom work. That that is the heart of kingdom work. And ask them a question, like, what's something I don't already know about you that would help me to understand you better? And it could be the person you're sitting next to or behind or in front of right now. You know, we cross each other's paths every week. Uh, We encourage you to take a picture and email it. This is us at 4C.org. Really easy one to remember. This is the first picture. I cheated. This was outside of our 50 days. But this was Christmas Eve. (laughs) Christmas Eve at our house. And... Boy, the, the, the girl uh, there at the end with Meg is a girl who did not have a family to be with on Christmas Eve, but she found a strong one in us, okay? And Gilbert and Christiana are there, and Ralph and Pam and Stephen, and Byron and Norma and her family, and I think I got, I got everybody. But we didn't know each other that well. But we just said, it's going to be awkward, and that's okay. Because like Justin's teaching us, like you got to get out of the boat if you want to walk on water, Right? And so that's what we did. We played a board game. We played a board game. We played a family feud kind of game. And it was great. And we learned all kinds of things about each other. And by the way, whose birthday is within a week of today? Anyone got a birthday within a week of today? I see one hand back there. Okay, whose birthday is today? Anybody's birthday today? Oh, my goodness. Oh, no, we've got two. We've got two. All right, what time were you? No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, here's what you got to do. You guys got to get together and play this game. All right? All right? Here, I'm going to give it to you. I'm not sure which hand it was down here. I saw, was it, is it Lynn? Yeah. And down there. You guys can share it because you're going to play it together. So you guys are going to be, we're going to get a picture of that and show it next week. And it's going to be kingdom work. It's going to be a picture of Jesus at work in this church. They're going to fight over it. I'm creating conflict. Isn't this great? Now we're going to persevere through it. Uh, We want to show some pictures on the walls around here of just Jesus at work through his people. Okay. Um, Consider using board games. I've I've given you some that could help that way. Um, Read a book. We've got these for sale today at the Twister table out there. Caring for One Another by Ed Welch. It's eight chapters. Very short. Read a chapter a week. It helps us to grow in what what we've talked about today. And they're $5. Suggest a donation. 10 if you want to help us give one away for free to someone else, okay? So 5 or 10 bucks on your mail. Please grab. We've only got 100 of them. After that, you can order them on Amazon. I gave you some places to order them on here, but buy, buy one today so that we can at least um, sell those off. Scripture memory, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I'd love us all to memorize this in the next 50 days. Just chip away at it. Um, and then some special events. Take advantage of some special events. We don't want to crowd our calendar with so many events that we can't invite each other over um, for a meal or a game. But there is a board game night this Friday. They're going to play Apples to Apples. So you can learn how to play that game. That Apples to Apples, that's the game that uh, our global partner is using in Southeast Asia. They just remade that game. and So it's a great game to facilitate relationships. Okay? Uh, and there might be some other possibilities, like I might challenge somebody to table tennis, and that'll be great. So uh, you see all that on there. The heart of it is, and listen, I know what some of our hearts are doing right now, and I get it. And listen, there's grace here, okay? We're in process. We're not going to get this done in 50 days. We're just hoping to get some momentum going. That's all. Just like we saw with the prayer time. That's it. But, if, you know, if you're thinking, I, I don't know how I can afford this because... You know, my time, I don't know when I would do this. I just want to suggest that I don't know how you can't afford this. I, I think that's what Jesus is sharing with us today. I don't, I don't know how we can't afford to prioritize this. If you're thinking, you know, I, I'm just not very hospitable. My house is a mess. I can't cook. Well, take someone out. You know, order some pizza. Um, you know, Meg and I learned this from Todd and Sharon Beal, who are usually in first hour. 
that hospitality is not about cleanliness. It's about your heart, you know. And we had some wonderful meals with the Beals when I was a struggling seminary student. But, man, there was one time we had this burnt grilled cheese. It was the most burnt grilled cheese you have ever seen. See, she's laughing about it. And we've joked, we've joked, we've talked, we've joked with Sharon about it. And uh, you know what? It was the best grilled cheese sandwich I've ever had because the fellowship was so sweet around the table. We all ate it and loved it. And I'm just saying the people who are the best at this, it's not because they excel at all the things we normally think about. It's their heart. It's their heart. You know, you might, you might be thinking, if I put myself out there, I might get hurt. I might get disappointed. I might turn and, and ask for someone's name today. They might just walk right out. And you know what? Congratulations. You just became more like Jesus. Because doesn't he know what it is to feel hurt? And then we seek him. That, that's it. That's it. You know? Maybe you're just not in a great season for doing this. You know, for jumping in all in with us on this. And I just want to say to you honestly, that's okay. All right? Not everybody can, you know, can go along at the same pace in every journey because we've got a lot of stuff God's dealing with us with. Some of us might be in really tough places hurting. I do not want anyone to feel bad about that at all. We want to know who you are so we can pray for you and pick you up. Okay? But uh, this is not... This is not a guilt journey. This is a grace journey, something we can have a little fun together doing, and something where the Spirit of God will show up in and through the hearts of His people and do some special things. That's, that's what we're talking about. And boy, I must say, and when I heard that, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. There's just, there's just something about when you speak someone's name and invite them to like, I was thinking about this, not to come all the way back to this, but just when Jesus first called his disciples, Simon, son of Jonah, you will be called Peter. When he taught people, don't you know me, Philip? Martha, Martha, why are you so worried? Mary has chosen what is better. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When he did his greatest miracles, Lazarus come out. When he crossed the lines of his day, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. And when he rose from the dead, one of the first words he spoke, Mary. Mary. And she recognized it was the Lord because she's heard him say her name so many times, like only. And people ran to him. And I believe that God's designed us to be the kind of church where we just want to run to each other and where others want to run to us. I want you to, let me just, let me just pray. Let's all just bow our heads, close our eyes this moment. I, I just want to give you a moment to respond in your heart. Maybe in your heart you would, you would commit to some aspects of this journey that we're calling each other to. Maybe we'd acknowledge any sin and just seek God's forgiveness and redetermine to apply some of the principles we've heard today. But what, what does this look like for you? What is Jesus asking you to do? It's probably not to start a board game night. We already have that. What is he asking you to do? When will you do it? Lord, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters. Bless them. Encourage them. May this be an encouraging journey. We, we have some goals, but Lord, the goal, the only goal, the end of it all, is just to, to know you more and to know each other more for all the reasons we've talked about today. Just bless us, Lord, on this journey. Be, be, be blessed by it, Lord. More, not just bless us. Be blessed by it. May it move your heart. May, may it be the kind of thing that in our, as best as we can imagine in our finite brains, it would just be the kind of thing where just members of the Trinity would just kind of 
nudge each other and say, look at that. We would call attention to heaven and say, look at that. Look at what Forest Lake Bible Church is doing. They're being the church. They're living it out. Lord, be blessed.